Well, I am so excited today uh, to have Mark Lazary, the co-owner of the Milwaukee Bucks, someone I get to call my friend here on the podcast. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. I know you are so busy and I am just so grateful that you would take some of your time today uh, to talk to us. You have such an interesting career and you're such a great guy. I'm just so grateful uh, that you're here on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's actually a pleasure and I look forward to our discussion. Yeah, thanks. So, so interesting. Some of the stuff I didn't even know I'm preparing for you today, my crack team uh, got me all this information. I watched one of your uh, YouTube videos where you gave a presentation at, at Wharton and I, a lot of the stuff I didn't know and it's so interesting. So you were born in Morocco and your family immigrated to the US when you were seven years old. Tell our listeners a little bit about what it was like to come from Morocco at seven years old to Connecticut and what that transition was like. I mean, how amazing. Um, you know, it obviously was different. Uh, <laughs> I think Morocco compared to uh, the United States is as different as you could be, especially I was born in Marrakesh. Um, We came here because my mom had a sister who lived in uh, right in Hartford, right around Hartford. Her husband had been an Air Force officer, and so they lived in Hartford. Um, you know, it was fun. I mean, it was actually very different. Um, it's, I think, as you know, this is a phenomenal country. Um, I think you quickly found out that things were kind of different. I had to pick up English pretty quickly. Yeah. How uh, hard was that? You know, I think when you're young, it's not that hard. It took me about three to six months. Um, but was able to pick it up really fast um and then sort of you know shared a room with my two sisters till i went to college so um i don't know if that was that much fun uh, <laughs> i could imagine not so no but it was you know you sort of go to high school same thing and played basketball did a bunch of sports um and that's sort of how my love for basketball came about and it was really interesting to me, uh, having a Jewish mom like you have a Jewish mom, when when I was listening to your YouTube video and you talked about your Jewish mom said you had to be an, either a lawyer or a doctor, hence uh, I'm a lawyer, you're a lawyer, you picked the law degree. Um, tell me about the process for you of going to law school. Where Did you think at that point you really wanted to be a practicing lawyer or was it more to get the degree and you were always businessly minded? Tell us, tell us about that. Um. So I actually, um, I worked at UPS the summer before I was supposed to go to law school. Okay. And it's a little bit of what you said. You know, my mom was very black and white about either um, you're either going to law school or you're going to be a doctor. Um, and that summer, I actually loved working at UPS. I was a truck driver and I loved it. And I remember I told my mother I wasn't going um, to go to law school anymore because I could make more as a truck driver than I could as a first year associate. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? And uh, she didn't miss a beat. Uh, she just whacked me uh, across <laughs> the face and said, no, you're going to law school. You know, and you're whatever, <clears throat> you're 21 years old. I, I told my mom that I was a grown man and that I could do whatever I want and that it was my life. She hit me again, <laughs> but your life begins when I tell you. It begins. <laughs> and as we look back, thank God for moms, right? Because they always know. We think we know. We don't know anything, but our moms really do know. Yeah, and that's what it was. So whatever, I went to law school. Um, I thought I'd be a tax lawyer because I, um, I was really good with numbers and ended up clerking for a judge um, in the bankruptcy court. And because of that, I got a job working for a bankruptcy law firm and, um, found out I really loved, um, you know, sort of being involved in understanding numbers and the law. Um, I left law after about a year to go work at a small investment firm, um, to be a lawyer on sort of their fund. And it, turned out to be great. I, I started doing investing at 27 and I found that I loved it and I found that I was actually pretty good at it. So I wish I could tell you there was this, you know, you knew these things. I, yeah. I, I don't think there's a, there's a lot of things you don't know about yourself. I mean, um, 
you could do math in your head really fast, but I think back then that didn't really mean anything. Uh, uh, so whatever, I found something I loved. I found something I was really good at and I found something I could make money at. Yeah, I look back and I think to myself, and I say this to everyone when I talk about you know, my career, and I'm sure you'll say the same thing. So much of our success is just based on luck and timing. It is. And, and, and you have to be humble enough to understand that that's okay. Because you, like me, I, I fell into a job for me that suited things I was naturally good at. And then you work hard and that allows you the ability to be successful. If you wouldn't have got into something where you found out you had the love of investing and then you could use all these skills you had and work hard, you know, our paths would would be different. And it's it's interesting because almost all the successful people I've talked to, it's a similar story. All of a sudden you're doing something and you start doing something else. And it all just kind of starts falling into place that gives you that opportunity, which I think is one of the reasons that this country is so great and makes life so exciting that that you can just find that and then just go with it and then create what you've created, which is which is so uh, impressive. I want to ask you one story, though, about when I was listening to that interview at Wharton, the story about when you started doing the investing and you made twenty five million dollars for uh, your company and it was bonus time. I absolutely love that story about all the work you put into telling, uh, you know, your bosses that you, you know, when they asked what bonus you wanted and uh, go through that for our listeners. Cause I think that's just such a terrific story. I mean, first of all, at your young age to make your business $25 million, your company, that's unbelievable. So you were doing some research and what, tell me about the process of, of asking for your bonus after making the company $25 million. You know, I was making, um, as a lawyer, uh, I was making about 50,000 a year and um, yeah, I got involved on the investment side very quickly and whatever made the firm about 25 million. And I called my dad and, you know, I've, you call up friends, what should you ask as a bonus? And, you know, my father was, look, you don't want them getting upset maybe you should ask for, you know, what you're making, ask for 50,000. And I was like, nah, dad, that's, come on, seriously, I made 25 million. I mean, it's, I think on Wall Street, they pay you a lot more. <laughs> and, you know, you just kept asking. So finally, and everybody would tell me different things. So I, I didn't want to risk pissing off my boss. And so I came up with the, you know, the thing was, okay, well, 1% of 25 million is 250,000. So I'm going to ask for half of 1%. I mean, who would ever say no to? Yeah, you sure wouldn't think so when they made $25 million. Right? Half of 1% seemed like a reasonable number. It was, uh, you know, it would be double my salary, you know, two and a half times. So I thought, okay. And I go in and I said, look, I'd like to, you know, I've made, you know, I take them through how much I've made and I'd like to get about 125000 and then I'm sure you've gotten this. We all have. You know, the person gets up, puts his arm around me, goes, Mark, you've done a great job. You know, we love you. Um, we're going to give you $10,000. <laughs> when you were telling the story, uh, when I watched it on the YouTube video, I thought they were going to give you more than you asked for. Honest to God, when you were saying it, I thought they were going to give you more because I don't know how it could be any more reasonable at 125 when you made them 25 million. But I guess, again, a great life lesson, because then you knew that company is not going to be for me. Uh, and so you get that information and you obviously know you're you're going to be really good at what you're doing. So what do you do from there? Then obviously you go somewhere else and talk to us about how you just ascended at such a young age to then found um Avenue Capital with your sister at 30 years old. Give give the listeners some, it, you know, your best bit of advice or something that happened or how you got from there to Avenue Capital in, in such a quick way. You know, and you know this, it's when things don't work out, right? Um, you quickly start figuring out, okay, what else do I have to do? I guess the advice I would give people is when there's such a difference of opinion of what you should make, 
really what someone's telling you is they don't value you at anywhere near the value you thought you were. So that's why I wanted to leave. Right. And, you know, the funny part is um, I go to leave and I got an offer at a firm accounting company where I was going to run partners capital and they offered me a hundred thousand dollars and I would have um, 25% of the profits. So I go to leave and the person whose firm it is says to me, I don't want you to leave. And I said, I know, but you know, here's what I'm going to do. He goes, how much are you making? And I said, well, they're, they've offered me a hundred thousand. I'm going to make double what I'm making. He goes, okay, I'll give you half a million dollars to stay. Uh, this is somebody who before didn't even want to give me a hundred thousand yeah, dollars. Too little, too late. And I remember I called my dad because we were, we were very, very close. And I said, well, what do you think? He goes, listen, this person has told you he doesn't value you at all. Don't, I know it's a lot of money and it's, you know, and at the time I had two children. He goes, just go, here's a place they love you or they, you know, they tell you they love you, it's a new place. So I went over there and that turned out to be the best decision ever. I think my father, um, I had a ton of really good advice of sort of how you should act in life and what you should do. Um, so I go to accounting company. We make the firm a lot of money. The following year, I get offered, you know, um, I get a raise, but at the same time, I now get 50% of the profits. And we made the firm a ton of money. Um, and that's how I met the Bass family. Uh, the Bass brothers um, came in and said, hey, would you like to run money for us? And sort of by 1990, by the time I was 30 years old, um, you know, it, it sounds funny today, but I was given 150 million to manage, yeah, which was at the time the largest distress fund in the world. And you know it was great. I mean, I, I loved it. Um, I ran money for the family um, for a couple of years and um, ended up, doing well for them. And then I decided to go off on my own. And, you know, I would tell, I would tell everybody, it's really hard. And you know, this when you sort of, you, when you started your firm, right. It's, it's just hard. It's because there's all these risks and um, everybody's trying to build a business. Um, and, you know, you hope you'll be successful, but you don't know. And I think for me, I, you know, my view of it was, look, if it doesn't work, uh, worst case is I'll go back to Hartford and I'll be a lawyer, right? So I had something to fall back on. Um, you know, and it worked out really well. I mean, it's just, I started investing my own money. Um, you know, back then you think you're really smart. So I ended up, uh, I would buy one thing a year, one or two things put all my money in it. So I started out with about $5 million and every year I doubled the money and sort of became 10, 20, 40, 80. And as it grew, you start getting really nervous. You know, what happens if you screw up? So um, I ended up, you know, you become the person you say you're never going to be, which is like conservative. And, <laughs> yeah. And when the numbers get bigger, it's hard not to be. It is. And that's what it became. And yeah, uh, and that's how we started Avenue with my money and that of the Bass family. And then it just, um, it grew from there. Yeah. I mean, it's an unbelievable success story. One, obviously I know you're very proud of and you should be and Sonia should be. It's amazing. Well, let's switch gears and talk about the reason that you and I met. And that is when you decided uh, to be a, a co-owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. And I'm just, and, and actually you and I've never talked about this, but I, I'm curious why purchase the Milwaukee Bucks? What did you all of a sudden always have a dream to be uh, an owner of a basketball team or just a professional franchise? How did all that come about and how did you get with your partners and walk us through that process a little bit about buying the Milwaukee Bucks? Sure. I think um, I was always interested in basketball and I played in college. Um, I had gotten involved in you know, I owned part of the Brooklyn Nets at the time and had made an investment, um, had tried to buy the Philadelphia 76ers, 
um, that hadn't worked out. Um, tried to get involved in sort of the Brooklyn Nets. I got outbid. And sort of when um, the Bucks became available, um, you know, sort of made sure not to sort of lose that one. And it, it was um, it was a sleepy franchise, I would say to you at the time. Yeah. I think when we looked at it, we were last in almost every category um, and sort of thought you could turn things around and got involved, you know, where we thought, okay, look, let's, let's do this. Let's do it for about five years, um, turn things around and hope, you know, that you could win a championship. You quickly found out that um, it was a lot harder than you thought. <laughs> It wasn't that easy. Um, I think we made a lot of mistakes on the way. And, you know, we got very lucky in a bunch of other things. Um, and I think um, as we learned the business, um, you know, made a bunch of decisions. I think in the beginning we brought Jason Kidd, which was great for the franchise. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, four years into it, I thought it was, we needed to have a bit of a change. Um, so we had a new GM, we had a new coach. Um, and I think that ended up, you know, being, you know, the right decisions. I think John Horst did a great job in, um, in, you know, trading for Drew Holiday and sort of building a team around. Yeah. To be honest. Um, but look, you know, let's be honest. Uh, I think for us, when we bought the team, um, we had, we didn't know, I mean, we had Giannis, I mean, he had just been drafted, Yeah, didn't know how good he was going to be. Um, and as we realized how good he was, I think we focused on trying to build around him. And, you know, I think the Drew Holiday trade was a huge risk on our end. And I think that worked out really well, obviously. Yeah. We're able to win a championship with that, but it, it's been a journey. I mean, it's you quickly find out that like everybody wants to win. Right. And yeah. and you can put together that the easy. best team yes. ever assembled and it doesn't guarantee you're going to win anything. I mean, that no. just isn't the way it is. I want to go back just a smidge, if I can, and just ask you about Milwaukee. Here you are, obviously living in, were you, you may have, were you living in Connecticut and working in New York at the time you bought the bottle? No, living in New York. Yeah. Living in New York. In okay. What did you know, if anything, really about Milwaukee? Did you have any knowledge? I mean, obviously you knew the Milwaukee Bucks were there, but did you know anything about the city or have any idea about yeah. what was going on there? T tell me well, about it, that. I I love the city because we managed uh, we managed money uh, for Northwest Mutual. Okay, so we knew the city really well, um, or I did. I thought it was a great city. I thought everybody was super nice i was actually you know every time i would come to milwaukee for business thought it was nice people couldn't you you, you had a very nice feeling about it i didn't realize that 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 actually everybody was nice you yeah know? midwestern people generally are just really nice people and east coast yeah. people a lot of times don't understand that until they're here no. it's been some time I'll give you a great story. We bought the team, right? It's the first game, right? First game. And I go and I sit down, cheering, having a great time. So the end of the first quarter, somebody comes and taps me on the shoulder and says, excuse me, Mr. Lassery, um, are you going to be sitting in those seats the whole game? I said, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, why? I mean, those are my seats. And the person goes, no, actually, those are my seats. I said, are you sure? He goes, yes. <laughs> and, you know, I look at my ticket and I was sitting in the wrong seats, right? I was, <laughs> I, was, I was like four seats away or whatever it was. <laughs> and I said, I'm so sorry. Why didn't you tell me? He goes, well, you know, you're on the team. I didn't want to bother you. <laughs> In New York, you know, five seconds. Get the <laughs> frick out of my seat. They want you arrested. They want you arrested. For oh, it was just, seat. that was my introduction to Milwaukee. Like, uh, That's awesome. When, so when you're buying the team, 
are you guys envisioning the deer district right away? I mean, is the, is this whole concept thought out before, or is this just like a work in process as, as you're going through, you buy the team and then you, you envision all the rest of the stuff you guys have done for Milwaukee. I, I think a lot of it, we knew when we bought the team, we had to build a new arena, right? So we just didn't know where that was going to be because we were going to have to work with the city and finding out, you know, and there were a bunch of different areas we were looking at. Um, so I, I I wish I could tell you we we thought about where, you know, that we were going to build a deer district. I think once we got the space and once we started building, part of it was, hey, let's have it be a big open space. And the reason for that is as we saw other arenas, we thought, oh, you could you know, you could put up screens and maybe people will come and watch and it'll be a place to congregate. Um, nobody thought it was going to be what it is. Yeah. Like, I think it, I think we, I think the decision we made of keeping everything open and um, trying to create an area that people would come to, um, I, I don't think we realize how much that was going to become a reality. Okay. And I think also the fact that, you know, we moved in and within a couple of years, we won a championship, ended up creating that deer district. Um, and that's taken a life of its own. And I think that's been phenomenal. Yeah. What is there any big difference between running your obviously extremely successful, uh, Avenue Capital versus running a sports team. Like what, talk about that. Is there any like big differences or separate challenges or something that you can point to uh, that, that strikes you as just, cause you've, you obviously know how to run a business. You've done it extremely successfully. Now you're running, uh, you know, this professional basketball team. And I'm just curious what the differences are. I, I would tell you the thing you quickly find out about the NBA is, um, What's what's the most important? Is it talent or is it team? Right. And I think, you know, the same thing at your firm. Do you want to hire someone who's exceptionally difficult, but really talented? Yeah. Or do you want to hire someone who's a team player who's very good, but may not be as good as, you know, the other person who's very difficult? And I think for us, we quickly decided that that's what we were going to do, that we were going to build a team and that by building a team, we thought we could create something um, that would have some real value. Um, you know, there's a lot of trades we didn't do um, because we felt, yeah, some of those players might have been more talented, but didn't know if they would work within the framework of our team. So right. I, I think... I think what we tried to do is sort of um, focus on, hey, here's how it's worked for us in business. Let's try to do the same thing on the basketball team. Yeah, and that's obviously really, really worked. So when you said that you bought the team, you looked at it as kind of a five-year uh, time frame for yourself. Obviously, it's been in the news lately. You've decided to sell your 25% uh, percent interest. Tears for me, because obviously over the years, I've gotten to know you and, you know, you're just such a terrific human being. You've always been approachable. I've enjoyed seeing you at all the games, even away games where I happen to be going. I see you there. We've, I was lucky enough to go to Europe with you and travel with the team uh, early on when you bought it. But tell me about the thought process from Mark saying, I think it's my time is done when it comes to the ownership of the Milwaukee Bucks. I'm sure that must've been very difficult. You won a championship. You've obviously grown this franchise unbelievably, um, you know, reported from the, I think 580 million or so you paid 3.5 billion in the less than nine years. I mean, wow, that is spectacular. But what happened all of a sudden for you to say, you know what, I've done this. And I think I, I, I my time, in this group is kind of run. Yeah, it's bittersweet. I, I don't know if there was a decision on it. I think it's, I think um, when we initially bought it, yeah, I, I thought it was an investment. 
Okay. I would tell you what it what changed is um, I quickly found out I loved it and that it was something that I really loved doing and wanted to keep on doing. That's sort of why we didn't sell and we kept on building. I think today it's, you know, it's a large amount of money. It just is. And I think part of it is also um, that, you know, I want to do some other things. And I do love, I just absolutely love being part of the team. I thought it was phenomenal. Um, but there were some other things I wanted to try and do. Okay. And, um, you know, I thought with the additional capital, I'd be able to do that. It's It was a really, really hard decision. I All wish right. I could tell you, you know, I, I never thought I would do it. And sort of ultimately when sort of made a decision to do it, um, you know, I'm still going to, my son lives in Milwaukee. I'm still going to be coming to the games. Um, you know, we've kept our season tickets, so I want to enjoy this season. Hopefully we win a championship. It's our championship to lose this year. I know it is. So, um, let's see what happens. Well, I, I would say this, I am, and you know, this we've talked about, I am the hugest of sports fans. Yeah. And whether it be Milwaukee Bucks basketball, I can remember as a kid being in the arena and in, in the corridor shooting little rubber balls myself and going to the games. And I've always gone to Brewers games, Packer games, traveled for games. And I can tell you this, my number one sports memory of all time is seeing the Milwaukee Bucks win a championship. I can tell you, I never thought in my lifetime the Milwaukee Bucks could win a championship. And I was lucky enough to be near you. And I have pictures on the floor of you holding up that trophy. And I honestly, it's the best memory, sports memory I have in my life is the Milwaukee Bucks winning this championship. And I know from myself and everyone in Milwaukee, we owe you the biggest amount of gratitude and thank you. You have always been so approachable, so kind, and I just, I feel lucky that we're friends. I, every holiday, you know, I send you a text wishing yep. you happy holidays. And I do it because I just have found you to be so kind and welcoming, you know, as an owner of a billion dollar franchise, you've always been Midwestern-ish at heart with, with the fans. And, you know, that isn't always the case. And I really appreciate that, that you always take the time to talk to people, talk to the fans, make time for me. And uh, I, we just owe you a debt of gratitude because without you and your people, you know, Milwaukee Bucks would not have this championship. And I hope you are just so proud every day of what you've done here for the city, oh, yeah. for the team. And we are, we are just so grateful. And I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but with all my guests, I ask a couple of questions. We put all my uh, podcast guests in what we call the Hupy hot seat, where I'm going to ask you three multiple choice questions. Okay. Basketball safety edition. As personal injury lawyers, we got to have some kind of tie. So we'll ask you just a couple of silly questions. Question number one, what is the recommended length of time for warm up and stretching before a basketball game? Is it A, 15 to 20 minutes, B, 25 to 30 minutes, or C, 35 to 40 minutes? Well, I think when you're old, you want to do as much as you can. Yeah, I don't know if this is geared to us, our age. Yeah, our so, I don't know if my crap team gave me these questions. Yeah, I, think I have a right or wrong answer, but I don't know who it's for. Um, I would say you at least have to do A, you know, so it's either A or B. Yeah, it's A, 15 yeah. to 20 minutes, so yeah. it's good. Uh, what is the most common basketball-related injury? Is it A, a dislocated finger, mm -hmm. B, a torn ACL, or C, a sprained ankle? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would say C. You're right. Yeah. Look at, I mean, you're not only super smart, good in, in uh, investing, good as a basketball owner, but look, these multiple choice squads, you're killing them. And the last one's a true or false True or false, high top shoes can help reduce the risk of ankle sprains and strains. Um, they should. So, yes, true. Yes, that's true. Um, 
it's funny though, if you look at players, they don't wear high tops anymore. You and I, I wear high tops. Yeah. Why why do you think that is? Have you ever talked to any of the players and asked them? Yeah. So they get their so the reason is because they get their ankles taped. Okay. You and I never did that. Yeah. Right. So they no. get all their ankles taped. So they've already got that protection. I see. Um, because I was like, why aren't we doing that? I did it. So obviously if I did it, it makes sense. Yeah, uh, but, exactly. Well, Mark, uh, thank you so much for your time. You. Congratulations on all the success. I feel so good. I think this year we're going to be standing there again after that so. whatever game, and you're going to be holding that trophy. But we are, I, I want to say it again because it's true. We we all here in the city of Milwaukee owe you such a debt of gratitude and a thank you for well, doing such you. a great job and just being you. And I look forward to continuing on our friendship and seeing you at the games. And I know whatever you tackle in the future, you're going to keep killing it just like you've done in life. So good luck with everything. And I look forward to seeing you soon. No, thank you very much. And thank you for the kind words. It's been a blast. 